In this lesson, we are going to talk about what's known as the standard deviation. And the standard deviation is a number that characterizes our data set, and it tells us on average the distance from the mean. So the larger the standard deviation, that means there's going to be more distance from the mean, which means the data values are going to be more spread out. If the standard deviation is smaller, then that means there's a smaller distance between the data values and the mean, which means the data values are going to be close to the mean and they're all going to be centralized. And then you just might have a few data values off on each side, but most of the data values are going to be really close to the mean. So for example, if I graphed some data and when I graphed it, it looked like this and we know that the mean is always going to be in the center most of those data values are in here. We have one big peak and all the data values are huddled together around that mean, which means this is gonna be a smaller standard deviation. I'll abbreviate standard deviation as SD. And then if I have a data set and I graph it and it looks like this, the data values are more spread out and I have my mean in the center, which means if my data value for the data set is more spread out or more varied, that means the standard deviation is gonna be larger because on average, the distance from the mean is gonna be larger. So think of the standard deviation as like the average distance from the mean. So we have some symbols here that I'm gonna go through with you. So just a quick recall, when we talked about the center of the data set and we were talking about the different averages we said the mean for the sample was x bar where the population mean looked like a fancy m and we would call that mu so just like we have a difference in the symbols for mean between sample and population we have the same idea with standard deviation. We have two different symbols. If we have a sample standard deviation, meaning the standard deviation that's calculated comes from a sample and not the entire population, we're gonna use the symbol S or SXX is what the calculator uses. Then if it's from the population, then the standard deviation for the population looks like an O with the funny little hat on top. Now this leads us into the empirical rule and I'm just gonna do a quick review over this. We're gonna get into this a lot more detailed when we get into the normal distribution, but the empirical rule works only, and I'm gonna underline this, works only with curves that are symmetric and bell-shaped. Um, and what this tells us is this gives us a relationship between the shape of the graph, the data, or the percentage of the data approximately that falls between different standard deviations away from the mean. But I want to stress that this works only when you have symmetric bell-shaped distributions. Now, what this rule tells us is if I come out one standard deviation, which is, remember what a standard deviation is, it's the average distance from the mean. If I come out one standard deviation in either direction from the center of my graph, which is the mean, here's my mean. This is saying that 68% of the data approximately will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. So if I come out one standard deviation this way and one standard deviation this way from the center, in that area should lie about 68% of the data that we have in our distribution. That's what this rule says. The next part of this rule, let me erase so that it doesn't get cluttered. Okay, the next part of this rule says, well, if I come out two standard deviations from the mean rather than one, I'm going to have more data under that curve, and that's going to increase to approximately 
So if I'm in the at the center, if I'm looking at the mean, and I come out two standard deviations in either direction, the amount of data that would be under that area of the curve would be about 95%. And then using that same idea, we can go out one more standard deviation. So if I come out one, two, three standard deviations in each direction, more than 99% of the data is gonna fall in the shaded area that I just shaded black. It's 99.7 approximately. Now you still have off to the sides here, it's these tiny little wings. There still may be some data under there, but there's gonna be very, very little. Those are your extreme cases or your outliers that go past three standard deviations in either direction. So just a quick rundown of what the empirical rule means, but we're gonna get into that in much more detail when we get into studying the normal curve. So just keep this in the back of your mind for later. Okay, now there's another rule called Chebyshev's rule. It's the same idea, but this rule you can use for any distribution and it will give you an approximate amount of data value that lies two, three, and 4.5 standard deviations out. And here are the percentages. And it would work the same way, it's just that this one is more generalized. Um, and again, this is, I can't stress this enough, this is just approximations. Okay, now for this first example, and I got this from the book, it shows you how you would calculate a standard deviation by hand. Now here's the sample standard deviation, how you would calculate that by hand. And then here's the population standard deviation, and that's how you would calculate that by hand. So you can see that this is the S, and the calculator just so you know uses the SX symbol. And then here's your um, symbol for population standard deviation, which is your O with the funny little hat. Now, the only difference between calculating the standard deviation for the sample or the population is just a difference of dividing by the sample size minus one or the size of the population, which they count that as capital N. That's the only difference in the way that you would calculate it. When you calculate by hand, it's not hard. It's not hard at all. It's just basic arithmetic. However, it's messy and it's long. I'm gonna show you how to do it by hand just one time and walk you through it so you understand what all these symbols mean. Um, but as far as actually calculating it on homework or your quizzes or anything, I'm gonna eventually show you here um, how to do this on the calculator um, because I don't even wanna do this. It's kind of a pain in the bum. We all know what the square root means. That's the symbol here. So we gotta do some stuff, and then the last step would be to take the square root. What's underneath that square root? Looks like this. Um, it's either gonna be capital N or N minus one, depending on if you're doing um, the sample or the population, but it's basically the same steps. This represents your data value. So you have to do this for every data value. You find the mean and you subtract it from the mean. Then once you find the difference between the data value and the mean, you square it. Then you take all of those values and you add them up. This symbol here means you add them up. And then you divide by either your sample size minus one or your population size. And then the last step is that you have to take the square root. Now, if you have a small data set, still a pain in the butt, but it's not as bad. When you have a large data set, this will take forever because you have to do that with each individual data value. So looking at this first example, it says there's a fifth grade class and the teacher was interested in the average age and the sample standard deviation of the ages of her students. And then it gives the ages of her students rounded to the nearest half year. And so, and it says there's a sample of N 
equals 20 students. So because this is a sample and it doesn't represent the entire population, we would use this formula here, where instead of dividing by the entire number in the population, divide by one less than that. So we're going to end up dividing by 19 at the end. Okay, so the first step, because we have to, if we were to do this by hand, we would have to take every single data value and subtract it from the mean. And then we once we find that difference between the mean and each data value, then we square it. So that's what this chart is here. So it's taking the data value of nine, it's subtracting it from the mean, which was calculated up here. The mean was when you take all the data values, add them up and divide by the number of data values that you have, which is 20. So for the first data value, we get nine minus the mean and we get negative 1.525. Then the next step is you square that. And then, so this is what we get. For the next data value, it's 9.5, that appears twice, so at the end we're gonna to have to multiply it by two. You take the data value, subtract it from the mean to get the difference between the two, then you square it, and then because this happens twice, we have to take that number and multiply it by twice, and this is what we get. So you have to do that for every single data value, and then you add it up. Remember we had that funny symbol, that means you're gonna add it up. That's this right here. So we're at the point now where we would add them all up and then we divide by our n minus 1 because we're using the sample formula and then the last step would be to take the square root. So this is all of our values added up, the 9.7375. We have to divide by 20 minus 1 because this is a sample, which is 19. And then we get this. And then our last step is to take the square root. So when we find the um, decimal value by hand and we round it to two places, we get that the sample standard deviation is 0.72. Now, most of this work is done for us in this table. I just walked you through how it's done. But you can imagine how long it would take. It's not hard. It's subtraction, you're squaring some numbers, you're adding some things. It's not that hard. It just takes a long time and it's very tedious. And this is only for 20 values. Imagine if we had to do this for 50 or something like that. So I'm only gonna walk you through that one time. From here on out, I'm gonna show you how to do this on the calculator. So this tells us that our standard deviation for our sample is 0.72. That means on average, we would expect if I randomly picked a data value from that set, on average, it would be about 0.72 from the mean. Okay, so now that we've seen how to go through that by hand, it's tedious, but not hard. I'm going to show you how you can do that on the calculator. So get your calculators out and you can start putting those data values of the fifth grade ages in your list. If you haven't done so yet, you wanna make sure that all your data values from the example are in your list. If you forget how to do that, you hit the stat button and then edit. We hit option one for edit. And then you enter all your data values in one of your lists. I put mine in L1. So if you haven't finished yet, go ahead and pause the video, put in your data values and then unpause. Okay, once you have your data values in there, to find your standard deviation using the calculator, you would hit the stat button again. Then this time, instead of being under the edit menu, you want to arrow over to the calculate menu and choose one variable stacks. From there, you want to tell the calculator that what list you put your data values in. I put mine in list one, so I wanna make sure that says L1, and then I'm gonna tell the calculator to calculate the one variable stacks. So I'm gonna hit enter, and then you can see up at the top that my mean is 10.525, and then if I come down here, these two values right here are my standard deviations. 
if this is a sample standard deviation, we use the SX. That's this one here. So you can see that what we get would be 0.715891, 0532. The book rounds it up to two places, so we're going to just use 0.72. If this was the entire population of her students and not just a sample, then we would use the population standard deviation, which would be this right here. So it would be 0.6977, et cetera. And then of course, if you wanna scroll down, you can find some more information, right? Remember down here, it says the number of data values, and then it gives us our five number summary down towards the bottom. So this is how you want to find your standard deviation. Okay, so now we verified the mean and the standard deviation on our calculator. So we have the mean which is 10 point, we'll round it to 5.3 10.53 and then we got that the standard deviation for the sample was 0.72 when we rounded it to two places. If I wanted to create a graph of what this data looks like, I'm going to assume that it has this bell-shaped curve, um, but in the future, when we get into normal curve stuff, we are going to have to verify that that's the case, but just to give you a visual representation of what this means, um, I'm going to use this graph. So in the center, we have our mean. Always the mean goes in the center, that's 10.53. Now, every time we come out a standard deviation, that's what this one means here. That means I'm coming out one standard deviation. So think about the standard deviation as you're marking your scale on your graph. Every time I come out one tick mark, that's going to represent one standard deviation. And when I'm going to the right, I'm going to be adding 0.72. But when I go to the left, I'm going to be subtracting because my number should be going down to the left. So when I add 0.72 to 10.53, one standard deviation to the right, that's going to bump me up to 11.25. So the distance from here to here is 0.72. That is my standard deviation. If I go over again another 0.72, I'm gonna add another 0.72, which is gonna give me an 11.97. And then if I go over one more time and I add another 0.72, that's gonna give me 12.69. Now going in the other direction, so I'll put a little plus here to remind you because we're going to the right, we're adding. When I go to the left and I subtract my standard deviation because my number should be going down. And that's why these are negative here because we're going down. Okay, so when I take 10.53 and I subtract 0.72, that's gonna give me a 9.81. And when I go another standard deviation to the left and I subtract another 0.72, that's gonna give me a 9.09. .09. And I'm gonna do it one more time because most of the data lies within three standard deviations in either direction. So usually we don't go too far past three standard deviations, but that doesn't mean that we, don't, we won't ever need to. Um, if I subtract another 0.72, that's going to drop me down to 8.37. So what this means, if I look at this, on average, the age of the students in the class is about 10.53 years old, so a little over a half. And so most everybody is going to fall within three standard deviations. If we think about the empirical rule, 68% of the students' ages are going to fall within one standard deviation, about 68%. And then we can use that rule to keep jumping out further and further. If I go out another standard deviation, that's going to be about 95% of the data. And then if I go out again one more time, that's going to be a little over 99% of the data.
Now, another thing, just to keep this in mind, because we'll go over this again when we get to normal curves, there is something called concavity when you're looking at graphs. Concave down means you're going to have what looks like an upside down bowl shape, or I like to call it um, a frown shape. This is called concave down. And concave up is a smile shape. which means it's going to be a bowl shape facing up. Now, you can generally see when you're looking at a graph, if you've got a symmetric mound-shaped graph, generally you can see where the first standard deviation is going to be because it's what's called at a point of inflection. The point of inflection point of inflection that is the point where it goes from concave up to concave down or vice versa in general. So this part of the graph right here is concave down. And then this part of the graph here looks like it turns to concave up, right? This part of the bowl looks like it's facing up and this up here looks like it's facing down. So that point what's called the point of inflection, should give us an estimation on where our first standard deviation should lie when we come out this way. So this point right here indicates approximately where our first standard deviation should lie, right? It comes out this way. Okay, now let's use our graph to answer these questions. The first question says find the value that is one standard deviation above the mean. So here's my mean. If I go one standard deviation above that mean, that means I'm gonna to go to the right because my numbers are going up. So that value is gonna be 11.25. And remember what these values mean. We're talking about the ages in this fifth grade class. So about 11 and a quarter years. Find the value that is two standard deviations below the mean. So below the mean means I'm gonna to go to the left. And since I'm doing two standard deviations to the left, one, two, I'm looking at this value right here. So that's 9.09 .09 years old. So just a hair over nine years old. Now this one says find the values that are 1.5 standard deviations from the mean. So in either direction, if it says from the mean, it doesn't give you a specific direction, then we're going to do both. Okay, so this one, how do we know how to do this? Well, because we counted whole numbers, right? We counted if we're one, two, three standard deviations away from the mean in either direction. So what if I want to know one and a half standard deviations? So that would be somewhere in here or somewhere in here right, in either direction. I want to go a little bit past one standard deviation. Well, I did it the same way up here. I just did it with whole numbers, right? If I wanted to go two standard deviations to the right, I would add two times 0.72 because I added it twice. If I went to the other direction to the left, two standard deviations, I would take 0.72, multiply by two and subtract because I'm going to the left. It's the same idea, only we're not going to be using whole numbers. If I want to go above the mean, 1.5 standard deviations, I'm going to take whatever the mean is, which in this case is 10.53, and I want to add because I want to go above the mean, so I'm going to the right, so I'm going to add one and a half of the standard deviation, which is 7.2. So if I find what one and a half point seven twos are and I add it to 10.53, that is going to give me 11.61, which we knew was going to be somewhere in here, right? Between 11.25 and 11.97. That's where it should be between one and two standard deviations away. Now, when I do the same thing for below, I'm just going to subtract. So now I'm going to do 10.53 and I'm going to subtract one and a half standard deviations. 
When I do that, I'm going to get 9.45, and this is, let me label this, this is below 1.5 standard deviations. So that gives me 9.45 when I do that, and that falls between 9.09 .09 and 9.81. So in general, you would use this formula. You would take whatever the mean is, and you would either add or subtract, depending on if you're going above or below the mean, and then you would take whatever your standard deviation is times the number of standard deviations. In this case, we multiplied by 1.5 because we wanted to go one and a half standard deviations. In this second example, we are gonna walk through and review a lot of the big topics that we talked about so far in class with the added value in there of calculating the standard deviation. So in this example, it says we're going to use the following data, which represents exam scores from a pre-calculus class, and we're going to create a frequency chart and then find some values on the calculator. So it says we're going to use five classes here. So we need to figure out what our class width is. So if you remember, in order to find the class width, we have to take the maximum value minus the minimum value, and then we're going to divide by the number of classes that we want. And then we always round up. Okay, so I'm going to take 100, and I'm going to subtract 33, that's my max minus my min, and I'm going to divide by 5 because I want 5 classes. So I get 100 minus 33, that gives me 67, and then I'm going to divide by 5, that gives me 13.4. So we're going to round up and say that our class width is 14. So that's going to help us set up our classes and our boundaries. When we set up our classes, we always start at the lowest value. So I'm going to start at 33. And since I want um, my class width to be 14, I'm going to add 14 all the way down to find my lower limits for all my classes. So that gives me 47, 61, 75, and then 89. Now, to find my upper limit of that first class, because we're including that lower limit in our class, and we want our classes to have a width of 14, that means my interval should be 14 numbers. So I'm going to go from 33, that's my first number in my interval, and then I want to add 13 more, so I have a total of 14. So 33 is the first number plus 13 more. So when I do that, I'm going to get 46. And then I'm going to add all the way down and keep adding 14 because that's my class width. Now you can see that I go for the first class, I get 33 to 46. Then the next class, I'll call this class 1, 2, 3, 4, and five. For class two, I jump up to 47 and go to 60. Then class three, I go from 61 to 74, etc. Now the boundaries is going to be what we use to close that gap and to make sure that all of our values fall on one of those intervals. So because all of these values in our data set, our whole numbers, remember our choices are for when we make our boundaries for decimal places, 0 0.5, 0 0.05, 0 0.005, et cetera. We always wanna increase our decimal place by one for our class boundaries. Since these are whole numbers, that means we don't have any decimal values, so I wanna bump up from zero decimal values to one decimal value. So my boundaries are going to use 0.5. So I'm going to 
So, which means I'm going to go a little bit before 33 and a little bit past 46 using 0.5. So my boundaries are going to be uh, 32.5 to 46.5. And then I'm going to go from 46.5 to 60.5. And 60.5 to 74.5, then 74.5 to 88.5, and then 88.5 to 102.5. And so now all of our gaps are closed. None of my data values are going to fall on those bond boundary values where I'm conf where I might get confused on which interval to place it on. And so now we're all set up. So now we just have to count our frequencies. So anything that falls between 32.5 and 46.5, we count that in our frequency column. So when we count those values, I did this ahead of time, but I've got for the first class, I counted two values. For the second class, I got uh, five values. Then I got 10, 6, and 8. If you want to verify those, go for it. Um, for the relative frequency, that's where you find the proportion, either as a decimal, a percentage, or a fraction, however you want to write it. So for the relative frequency, since there are 31 values in this data set, that would give me 2 out of 31. And if we put it as a decimal, we can approximate it as 0 0.06. Then I would have 5 out of 31, which I can approximate as 0.16. 10 out of 31, which I can approximate as 0.32. 6 out of 31, which, which I can approximate as 0.19. And then the last one, 8 out of 31, which I can approximate as 0.26. And then our last column that we want to use for our frequency chart is the cumulative frequency, which we're going to just add up each row by row and see how the combination of these classes add up. So for the first class, we only have two. For the second class, if I add the frequency for class one and two together, that would give me a seven. Then for the third class, if I add uh, the frequencies for class 1, 2, and 3 together, I would get 17, etc. And if I keep going, that would give me 31, which checks out. That should add up to 31 since we have 31 data values. Okay, so a quick review of frequency charts. And now we are going to actually um, find some information on the calculator. For the second part, we want to find the mean the standard deviation. This is the one that's new that we just learned. We're adding it in to do a review. We want to find the median, the first and third quartiles, and then the interquartile range. So go ahead and bring up your calculator and start entering the data values into your list. So we'll put that data set in our list. Go ahead and go to stat and then edit. I already put my data values in. I put them in my L1, so if you haven't done so, go ahead and pause the video and make sure they're in there. Once you are ready, then you can hit the stat button. We're gonna arrow over to calculate and we're gonna do one variable stacks to get all that information that we're looking for. So I'm gonna hit enter on one variable stacks. I'm, since I put my data values in list one, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that that says list one, and then I'm going to hit calculate. So our sample mean, if we round to two places, we have 73.52. Then if we come down, we want our sample standard deviation, so we're going to use SX. Keep in mind that if you're looking for the sample standard deviation, we use SX. So for us, if we round it to two places, that's going to be 17.92. And then as we scroll down, we can get more information. Our quartile, or our first quartile is 61. 
our third quartile is 90, our median is 73. So that's all the information that we need to know. And then we can use the first quartile and the third quartile to find our interquartile range. So going through and labeling everything that we found on the calculator, we got that our mean was 73.52 if we round to two places. The sample standard deviation, remember that's our SX. Here, let me label this. This is our mean, our SX. Uh, that was 17.92. The median we got was 73. The first quartile we got was 61. The third quartile was 90. Now using the first and the third quartile, we can find the interquartile range by taking Q3 minus Q1. Remember that was the middle 50%. So we would take 90 minus 61, which would give us a 29. Now we can use all that information to draw our histogram and our box plot. We're gonna do this, let's see, on the same axes. If I look up at the top at our frequency chart, so looking at our class boundaries, we can see how we're going to graph this. 32.5 to 46.5. Then the second class is going to be 46.5 to 60.5. Then we're going to go up to 74.5, 88.5, and then 102.5. So our frequency, when we graph that on the side, the highest frequency it looks like we have is 10. That's this one here. So I'm gonna just go from zero to 10. I'll go by twos, two, four, six, eight, 10. Okay, so our first frequency for the first class was two. So that's gonna be our first bar right here. And then the next frequency, sorry if this is making you motion sickness here, back and forth, back and forth. Um, let's see, the next bar is gonna have a frequency of five, then 10, six, and eight. So there's our histogram now. If we use the same number line to graph my box plot, so we're gonna use the same axes down here for our box plot, our minimum value is 33. So really close to 32.5. There's our minimum. And then our maximum was at 100. So somewhere close to 102.5, but a little bit less. Then our first quartile was at 61. Then our median was at 73. So a little bit less than 74.5, somewhere about right here. And then our third quartile was 90. So about right here. So here's my middle 50%, here's my median, and then I draw my whiskers out to the max and then to the min. So there's my box and whisker plot, and now let's label this because we know this represents exam scores. I'm gonna label down here, these are exam scores. And there you go. So really nice review of all the big topics that we've talked about so far, including the standard deviation. Now remember what the standard deviation means. The standard deviation means on average, if I randomly pick one data value, on average, the data value is gonna be about 17.92 Unix away from the mean. In this last example of this section, we're gonna see how standard deviations are really helpful when you're comparing uh, values from two different data sets. And you can even do this if they're different units of different data sets. Um, in this example, we're gonna compare two 
GPAs of two different students that are in two different schools. We have John and Allie here, and we want to see which student has the highest GPA when you're comparing it from school to school. Now, clearly, John is using the typical GPA system that we're familiar with, where 4.0 is perfect. Um, Allie looks like she's on a different uh, GPA system than what we're used to you know, seeing. So it's kind of hard to say how she's doing in comparison to John. So this is where standard deviations come into play, where we can really use this to compare their two GPAs. So before we actually go in and compare the two GPAs, I want to actually go through a couple of formulas with you that you will find very handy. And it's different depending on if you're looking at the sample and the population. The idea is the same, but the symbols that we use in the formula are going to be different. Okay, so for a sample, when you are comparing different data values from different data sets, you want to do what's called a standardize it which means if you standardize it, you're looking at not the actual standard deviation itself, not the actual distance, but how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. And when we label that, and we call that standardizing, We call that um, the idea of looking at it in terms of how many standard deviations rather than the actual distance, that's called standardizing. But then the symbol that we use to find that value, that's called the z-score. Okay, now the formula to find your value of z, which tells you how many standard deviations away from the mean that you are, you would take your um, value of your data set. So that's your, let me label this here, that's your data value from your data set. You subtract the mean of your data set and then you divide by whatever your standard deviation is. And that will tell you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. Now, if you're doing this in terms of a population, the only difference is, is that the symbols change because now you're using, to find your value of z, you're using your mu because it's the mean of the entire population instead of the sample mean and then you divide by the symbol for the population standard deviation, which is the O with the little funny hat. The meaning is the same. The symbols are just different because you're taking it from the population instead of the sample. So the Z tells us how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. If it's a negative value, then that means you're below the mean. If it's a positive value, then that means you're above the mean. And if you get zero exactly, then that means you're sitting right on the mean. If you're zero distance away from the mean in terms of standard deviations, then you're sitting on the mean. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the position you're at in relationship to the mean. Now, these two formulas here, you can always rearrange them to solve for a different variable. So, for example, if I look at this formula right here, if I know what the value of z is, and I know my standard deviation and the mean, and I'm trying to find what the data value is, you can use your algebra skills to rearrange that formula to find out what the data value is. And so if you're looking for the data value, and I rearrange this, you would have this formula. 
you would have your value of z times your standard deviation, and then you would add your mean. Now, that would be for the sample, and the same thing goes for the population. You would just use different symbols. I would take my value of z times my standard deviation for the population plus my mu. So I'm going to standardize John and Allie's GPA so we can do a comparison because they're clearly on two different systems and it's hard to compare who's doing better. Um, so by standardizing it, we can make that comparison. So I'm going to find the Z score for John. I'll call that Z. I'll put a little J down here for Z for John. Now John's GPA is 2.85, so that's his X, that's his data value. Now we have to subtract the mean for his school, which is three. And then we're gonna divide by the standard deviation for his school, which is given in the chart, which is 0.7. When I put that in on the calculator, I'm gonna get negative 0.21. The negative means it's below the mean, so a little bit below average is John. And you can see that here too, right? The average is three and he's a little bit below average, but how does that compare to Allie? So let's do Allie. So Z, A for Z Allie, her GPA is 77, so I'm gonna take her data value, subtract the mean, which is 80, divide by the standard deviation for her school, which is 10. When we put that in the calculator, we're gonna get 0.3 negative, which again, you can see that she's a little bit below average, which is why she has a negative here, but she's a little bit worse off than John. She's further below the mean than John. So John is definitely doing better with his grades in comparison to Allie at her school. So now comparing, I can see that John's doing a little bit better than Allie is at, at his school because his standard deviation is smaller, meaning he's closer to the mean than Allie. So my conclusion might be that John's grade is slightly better than Allie's grade.